Here we are, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. We're picking it up from the middle of verse 7. You'll see there's a fairly natural break there, even a paragraph in some versions of the scripture. Um, we we uh, are talking about the beating heart of Christian community. The beating heart of Christian community. Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom and glory. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. So tell your heart to beat again. Be raised to life in Jesus Christ. Let the Holy Spirit pulse through your soul even this day and be renewed. And you know something? When we get ourselves freshly right with God and remind ourselves of the goodness of God, we also experience our heart beating again for the people of God. It's simply not possible to say, I love Christ, but I don't love the church. The two simply go together. The body of Christ, the bride of Jesus Christ are precious to God himself, so we cannot love God without also lo loving the body of Christ as well. Paul's salvation led to fellowship. My salvation led to fellowship. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have what? Fellowship with one another. The two great commandments are to love God and then also to love our fellow man. And the scripture says we should especially have love for God's people. Galatians 3.28, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, nor is there male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And I just want to say this, um, that... The ultimate brotherhood and sisterhood is always between believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Can I have an amen on that one? So your brotherhood or sisterhood is not your football team or your sorority, though I get it. It's not your class or your school or your university or your city or region or state or nation or nation of origin. Our unity and our identity is not our gender or our generation or our race or our job or, or our position or our struggle or our wound or our hurt or our passion for all are one in Christ Jesus. That's the believer's supreme identity. All other identities can become barriers to the gospel and to the glory of God. Revival alone will win the land for Jesus. We must die to self and live for Christ. Can I personalize this again and say, your identity is not a political party. Somebody encourage me because I'll stop preaching in a moment. Your identity is not a political party or a TV station. It's not who you're against or who you're for. It's not your addiction or the bankruptcy or the divorce or the robbery or the fire or the assault or the, assault or the wreck. It's not your bitterness, not your depression, not your fear, not your sickness. Your identity is not your house or your car or your yard or your bank account or your second home. Your identity is not your phone, not your phone, not your phone. Your identity is not who you're in with or who you're out with, who you're with or who you are without your identity. Your identity is not even your kids or your grandkids or your standing in the fantasy football league. But Jesus Christ is the identity of the believer and he's our unity. That's what draws us together. He's the hope for America with all our troubles. Jesus, somebody say his name. Give him praise. And so when we grab how all-consuming is the love of Jesus and how all-important is the love of Jesus, um, every barrier gets broken down. And uh, I love that song, I'm no longer a slave, we're no longer bound. And then our heart beats again for Christian community. It's not about me, it's not about you, it's not about our issue, it's not about our thing, it's about Jesus Christ. And when Jesus is first, then com Christian community follows very closely 
behind. And so we're going to see a fresh vision in our scripture here of the healthy, steady, beating heart of the Jesus people. Through the blood of Jesus, God gives us a new day. It's a new day at New Hope. We can reboot the modem every day. Now, discipleship is vital. We hear a lot about discipleship. We talk a lot about discipleship. Tim Keller said this this week, there is no more important means of discipleship than deep involvement in the life of the church. Maybe there is a barrier that keeps you from enjoying Christian community, that you keep yourself to yourself. You don't really uh, see yourself as identifying with a people. But I tell you what, when you've been raised with Christ, there's a love for his people, there's a love for the fellowship, and historically it's been called the communion of sin. Uh, sorry, the communion of the saints, not of sin. <laughs> not of sin, sorry. <laughs> Forgive me. The communion, I'll be preaching about sin a little bit later. Reese, don't forget to mention the sin but we're the community of saints, amen? We have been sinners, we still attempted to sin, but I thank God that we are saints today. So I pray that we'll be tender-hearted today, that we'll be teachable, we'll be willing to be led, willing to ourselves be stretched, and sometimes even to hear things that we don't want to hear. By the way, when I get, why don't you say this, pastor? Why don't you preach about this, pastor? I'm not supposed to preach somebody's favorite hits. And sometimes we hear stuff that we don't want to hear. I think I'm supposed to keep saying that, even if somebody doesn't like that along the way. But we're going to preach Jesus Christ. And we simply see here, with a lot of words, a lot of precious words, we will get into the detail, but I think we can see two very simple, beautiful metaphors this morning. We're going to look at the metaphor of mother and the metaphor of father. So we'll keep it very simple today. But this is some of the greatest stuff ever written about leadership. Did you know that? I love leadership books, I read a lot of leadership books, but you can't beat the Bible when it comes to how we lead and how we need to be led. Behind these words is the real and true story of Paul and his church, and I think we can take a lot of this home and apply it to our everyday lives. You know, students are feeling some of the division in society right now as well. Here's an opportunity for students just to, to knuckle down and see what God's word is and to find our true identity and how we can lead at this time. It's time for God's children to lead. And so uh, we're simply gonna focus on these two powerful metaphors, mother love and father love. So first of all, let's talk about the mother love that the Apostle Paul uses as a metaphor to describe the way that he ministers to the Thessalonians. I'm a little frustrated. I don't know if Louise close right now. She's on the live stream. One of our girls is not well, but I'll be talking about that a little bit later. But when I think of motherly caring, she's the first place. Of course, I got my own mum which is the same as a mom. Uh, and, but I've got Louise as a picture for me. And uh, so I, I, uh, Louise is a very able Bible teacher. She spends hours each week preparing for a Bible study, alternates between the North and the South Campus on a Wednesday night. And I'm saying, give me some insight onto to the motherly love that's here, what Paul was meaning by that. So I'll share some of that. But let's just look, first of all, at motherly caring. Verse 7, instead we were like young children among you, just as a nursing mother, we looked at that last week, young children, just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you, because we loved you so much. We were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. We were saying last week, it is possible to live with pure motives. To those with impure motives, they tend to think that everybody else is impure, but to the pure, all things are pure, and Paul is saying we loved you in a truly caring way. It is possible to live a victorious Christian life in a humble, sacrificial way and for God to get all the glory, amen? It's possible and it must happen, and Paul says this is the way that we loved. They lived like Jesus, this missionary team had the character of Christ formed in them, they became more and more like Jesus, and the fruit of the Spirit was manifest in the Christian community. So I asked Louise, tell me a little bit about mother love. Tell me, let's talk about this passage. And so this is what she said. She says, well, the nursing mother in verse 7b, second part of verse 7, shared her life. The nursing mother picture here, first of all, nurtured the baby in her body and then on her body. 
She holds the child's. We're told uh, scientifically that skin-to-skin touch is very important when it comes to a baby. Now, of course, this is a metaphor. We're diving into the metaphor, and then we're thinking, how do we apply that to uh, the Christian community? But Louise described here a heartbeat-to-heartbeat relationship of close proximity, of letting ourselves be vulnerable and a, a mutual relationship. And so, really, this is a passage of the child being fed by the mother. It's an image that sometimes we almost find uh, slightly embarrassing, even though it's the way that God created us to be. And so Paul says, in effect, I didn't stand over the crib and preach at you from a distance, I nursed you. He's emotionally involved, he's present. He was not an office-bound pastor. He was out and about and in hospitals and homes and prisons and schools and on the streets. When the baby cries, you're up. This is all in leadership and pastoring. You know, I feel sorry for a pastor who thinks it's a career or a stepping stone or a thing. What misery. The ministry is about the people who are around us right now. I said to a pastor in another country once, remember that Jesus said, feed my sheep, not experiment with my guinea pigs. I'm not sure he ever quite stopped experimenting with the guinea pigs, but you know the ones that God has placed before you, that's the real deal and that's the real thing and people are called to be loved and cherished and served. And so wherever Paul was, he loved those who were, uh, were around him. Paul was not in the ministry for money or for status or for ambition. He loved them for a lifetime. He proved that he was a mercenary, not a hired hand. He is a shepherd. He was like a caring, nursing mother, and a mother can never forget the baby at her breast. And so we cared for you because we loved you so much. We delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. So do we sense the affectionate nature that the Apostle Paul has for the Thessalonians? Now, it's still one-way traffic. Last week and this week, it's about how Paul ministered to the Thessalonians. Next week, we're gonna see how the Thessalonians responded to that loving care. But can we just pause and apply this and say, a church needs great caring. And I thank God for the caring that there is in this church. We need a heart for one another. We need a tenderness for each other. There needs to be affection between one and the other. Can I have an amen on that? And yes, we need caring ministries. Bless you. We need caring ministries as well. I put in my notes here, deliver us, Lord, from Absaloms who stroke and flatter, pretend that they are the answer for their own selfish ends. If only I were a judge in the land, but give us instead Davids who will shepherd the flock skillfully. May we have that same caring spirit. I need to tell you a story of Kevin and Darla Miller. Uh, they're in a network of pastors that Louise and I are part of, pastors and wives, about 50 of us gathered together each year, and uh, we have a prayer card for each other, and so we pray for the different pastors in this network, and Kevin and Dala have been uh, pastoring the church Hebron uh, in Dakula in Georgia. Uh, formerly, the pastor Larry Wynn was one of Ike Reichard's best friends and still is a great, great friend of Ike, and uh, Rosemary Preston, those that you know and love Rosemary, uh, has been going to that church for a few years when she moved away to be with her family. Kevin and Dala are, are loved by the church. It's a very similar set to the North Campus here, and uh, we'd heard the news that Kevin and Darla were going to be moving on, and I was interested because I'd been praying for them that week. Uh, their card had, been, had popped up at my prayer time last week, and so we tuned into the church website and found the, the message how Kevin was announcing that he was moving on, and he told the story uh, about how he'd been challenging the church to be sacrificial, to lay it all on the altar for Jesus Christ and to obey God as to what, what we should do next. And that's the right spirit for every church minister, every church member. Lord, show me how I can serve you, how I can be a sacrifice. Uh, and I praise God because uh, when we do that together, that's an awesome thing. Anyway, the Lord led Kevin and Darla. And it was that day, he was just a couple of weeks ago, was resigning the ministry there uh, of that church so that they could be house parents for seven middle school boys. And I thought that was pretty cool because it was not saying, hey, I'm, I'm just, uh, everything's up and to the right and I'm just foraging my own way. But they just heard the voice of the Lord and then to hear the way that Kevin shepherded the flock and loved the flock and cherished them and encouraged them and said, we'll still be living not far away and we love you. It was a sweet picture of, 
of pastoral care, and if you like, of that motherly love that the Apostle Paul was describing. So can we give God praise for that sweet story? And I just honor my brother and sister, Kevin and Darla. Now secondly, with this spirit of caring, we see from verse nine to 10, a picture, and I've called it motherly labor. And I know that that's a kind of a mixed metaphor along the way. But uh, we see here in these verses that there's got to be care, but there's also got to be that commitment to go with it. There's care and there's commitment. There's making the love concrete. And we see here that they had toil and hardship. In chapter 1, verse 3, we talked about the labor prompted by love and your endurance inspired by hope in the Lord Jesus Christ, the work produced by faith. And so Paul keeps reminding us that it was hard work in the church. We work night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preach the gospel of God uh, to you. And so as we think about the picture of the motherly love, yeah, where does it all begin? It begins literally with labor. And, and uh, sisters, we just want to say thank you for your commitment there. Uh, and and uh, wow, Louise, uh, I just remember when Megan was born, just thinking that the awesome power of a woman to give birth was, was incredible. And I was amazed. Now, now, I think when I put it all together, Louise has had less than 24 hours of labor with the three children. I think it was about eight hours for Megan and about seven hours for Eleanor. And Louise would say, no pain relief. She's very proud of that. And then 45 minutes for Sarah. That was very, very quick, that one. So if you think about it, that's a, and, and, and a woman never forgets that, but it was less than a, than a day's, less than a day was labor. Now, it's a very important day. And, and don't ever forget that one, brothers, amen? Just say, I'm not gonna forget that. But she's had 26 years as a mother. And I just thank God for her faithfulness. And, and the reason she's not here today, of course, is a motherly uh, responsibility. And so I just thank God for, for that uh, sacrificial love that the mothers in this room have. And, and I'm saying this, and it's not even Mother's Day. But I guess every day should be Mother's Day as so we thank God for the, for the loving care. But that is the reality that there's, there's a caring, there's an affection, there's a tenderness, but there's also a commitment and a hard work. And much of parenting is just really tough. And uh, I think sometimes people go into, into uh, church life and they go into leadership and they're leading a group or, or they're involved in some kind of ministry or they're a minister. It's like, well, this is really hard. It's like, yeah, it's basically a lifetime of being crucified with Christ. Amen. It's been sold. And actually to be part of a church, to be a church member is to be sold out for him. It makes me think of my mom. And when I think of her days as a single parent after my dad died, she just worked so hard. She was running a guest house. She retrained as a cordon bleu chef, which is the same as, that's the same as Gordon Bleu. Okay. She trained to be a chef, and she, she was a night teacher as well, so she would just work all day and work all night. I remember when the roof had to be fixed, it was about a sixth of the price of the entire house and how she just scrimped and saved and made things work, and she's still working that way as well. Parenthood is hard work. Being a mother is hard work, and being a Christian, being part of the body of Christ has that struggle and labor and service about it as well. But I tell you what, let me say, our labor is not in vain, as the Scripture says. And if you've been faithfully serving, you again, you were on the, the stage this morning, you're in the tech team, and you've been doing this for a long, long time, thank you for your service. Keep it up in Jesus' name. But there's also the motherly example as well, because it's one thing just to, to labor and work and do the stuff and go through the routine. But Paul says, verse 10, you are our witnesses, and so is God, of how holy and righteous and blameless we were among you who believed. A mother and a shepherd needs to love and to labor, but also to be holy. We can't do God's work in an unholy fashion. James 1.20 says, man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God requires. We have to do the Christian work. We have to do the will of God in righteous fashion. If sin creeps in, it affects the whole thing. If bitterness creeps in, unforgiveness creeps in, unreconciliation creeps in, and we start acting that out, it's a destructive outcome. Instead, if we are holy, we're trusting God, we're obedient to him, there's a blessing that comes through that. And so we see here the motherly example. The example of a good mother, the example of Paul, and Paul is not afraid to say, you were witnesses, you saw that we were not out for the money, you saw that 
We were not out for ourselves, but we were out for the kingdom of God. And so that's mother love. Let's turn also to father love as well. And Paul, by the way, was well aware that he was using a contrast in these two metaphors. First of all, we loved you like a mother. And there also needs to be that father love as well. Verse 11, for you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children. Now, all the experts tell us that sometimes it's really hard for us to hear a message about the fatherhood of God if we've had some kind of negative experience ourselves of father. Well, that's, that's understandable, but the scripture is here for our blessing, and Paul clearly has some sense of ideal of what the Father is like that we must aspire to in the Christian community as well. Every one of us is called to have that nurturing mother love, one towards each other, but every one of us is also called to have that part of fatherhood that Paul is singling out here. Now, what was meant by as a father? It seems that the listeners, or rather the readers of 1 Thessalonians, would have had a sense of the Father especially as a teacher, everyone say teacher, and an example. No, say example. Now, of course, mothers are teachers and examples, but it seems like Paul is really emphasizing the caring side from the mother and the teaching side when it comes to the father. Now, I've heard John and Donna speak on this about uh, the role of the husband and wife, and often heard you say that the wife is the, like the heart, and the husband is like the head. And that's, there's, there's a lot of truth in that, isn't there? That's not like a strictly speaking thing. The husband still needs to have a big heart, and the wife still used to use uh, the brilliant mind that God has given her. But there's some sense in which Paul is drawing out this teaching example side that the father was called to demonstrate. And that's a challenge for us, all us dads. It's a challenge for all leaders as well to have that combination of head and the heart in what we're doing. And what does that fatherly example look like? It looks like encouraging, comforting, and urging to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. So let's just look at those words. First of all, that word encourage. Say the word encourage. So we're supposed to encourage each other. Sunday school family group leaders, you're supposed to encourage your people. And those within the group, you encourage each other. I know Al's getting ready for baptism right now. Al and Shelley, I hear that you had your, uh, your um, weekend away as a Sunday school group. 62 of you went away together. And there's no question, Al's the leader of that group. And you've got other leaders, great leaders there. But there's a sense of mutuality as well, that we've got to encourage each other. And not just a, it's not just one-way traffic. Uh, what does encourage mean? It means not to scream at the referee from the sidelines, but it means to put courage into the children, put courage into the people. Be bold, be strong, for the Lord your God is with you. Remember, my brothers and sisters, the battle is not yours, but the battle is the Lord's. That's what encouraging does. We encourage each other. We lift each other up today. So be encouraged in Jesus' name. Leave this place today being a little bolder in the faith, wanting to bless others and serve each other. And then there's that word comfort. Everyone say comfort. It's the same word. It's a word not often used in Scripture, but it's the same word used when the community came to Martha and Mary and comforted them after the loss of Lazarus. It's the kind of word that helps us get through tough times, trials, and temptation. It's a consolation and kindness. So a father love has to do that. We're, at, we're on the one hand encouraging. We're on the other hand being very tender. When a father consoles the child, that's a sweet thing. I remember when I was a little boy, we had this beautiful little black kitten. By the way, where I came from, people, people like cats because they killed all the rice that, that made the black death that gave us the plague. So that's why people like cats. And so we had this beautiful little black kitten and, uh, called Suki. She was six weeks old. And we loved this little kitten. She was so sweet. She was the kind that when you put her hand up, she would jump her head up just to be stroked by you. We thought she was the sweetest little kitten. And then we found out like the next week that she had an incurable illness. Sorry to laugh there, but an incurable illness. And so we were all heartbroken. She had to be put down by the vet. And so we were really, really sad about this. And I just remember my dad uh, walking into the room with all these grieving grieving children, and he just kind of ruffled my head like this, just kind of ruffled my head like that. And I guess that was consoling, and just saying, I think that was my dad's way of saying, there, there, son, I understand, I recognize what's going on. And you know, some people like a hug, some people don't like a hug. 
And we tend to like the side hug here in, in, the, in the southern states, don't we? I've learned how to do the side hug, like, a, like that. And uh, Michael, says, Michael says it's a cool thing to high five the kids. So I, it's good to high five people as well. So however we connect with people, let's make sure that there's that spirit of comforting each other. It's a good thing when we remember what someone's going through. We, we remember their life story, and it may be an anniversary that comes around. Thirdly, urging. Paul and his partners would not have been faithful, says the Wesley Bible study. Paul and his partner would not have been faithful if the, they had not held the Thessalonians accountable. There's an accountability where we need to urge each other to be faithful to what God has given us. And you know, as pastor, last week I was urging us about a couple of things. I was urging us about faithfulness in our giving. I think in this day of unprecedented distraction, we probably need to urge one another with regard to the priority of worship. And I thank you for doing that. We've been showing up a little earlier to make sure that we sing together and make it a priority, not just to do Sunday school, and not, not just to do the thing we like best, but it's like, I'm going to stop and I'm going to sing and I'm going to praise God. I'm going to sit under his word and then I'm going to respond to his word. I know that we sometimes have ants in our pants. And we get so distracted by stuff going on. And, and I trust in the balcony, you're looking at your Bible and you're not streaming a movie right now. I think we've got, we got challenges in this culture that we didn't have in previous generations. And so I think we've got to be especially wise in prioritizing Jesus, Jesus, worship the Lord. I need to grow. And, you know, we don't get hours and hours worshiping together each week, but if we're going to only have an hour, let's make it the best hour we could possibly have. That's what urging's like, encouraging each other to rise up to be who God wants us to be. Make sure you're in a Sunday school family group because you know something, if you come along to church, something happens to you, you get the flu, and you disappear, you feel discouraged. But if there's a group that knows about this, and they're praying for you, and they're sending you flowers, and Theraflu, or whatever you need, or chicken soup, whatever, it's a good thing to be in community together. So let's urge one another on. Jesus returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour, he asked Peter. Can we not give the Lord our full attention for this hour? You know, this world is crazy, and we've got the possibility of truly finding our contentment in Christ. Tell your heart to beat again for Christian community. May there be that loving motherly tenderness. May, that be, may there that be that encouraging, consoling, urging fatherly love one to another. May the leaders have that in big measure, but may every one of us aspire to that to have a beating heart of Christian community. And what I want to do right now is just to talk about what's going on in the world. We believe that Jesus is the answer, amen? And we believe that the church is a massive part of that answer. I just want to remind ourselves of, of the struggles that are going on. You know, we've, as a church, we've journeyed through the story of Charlottesville. And because we're a diverse church here, we sometimes feel the tremors of that, and perhaps in a way that, that other churches don't experience. But it, it's, we feel the tremors, but it's also glorious as well. We get the triumph as well, because it's a sweet thing to be together with God's people. We've journeyed through Harvey and Irma. And, you know, we prayed about Puerto Rico. I know Bob and, and his family were praying because they hadn't heard from their family again in, in Almi's group. And we had a prayer time for Puerto Rico. And uh, wh even while we we're in church that day, they heard that their families were doing very, very well. We've, we've journeying today through the Las Vegas story, a terrible situation. How do, we, how do we interpret all this stuff? Can I just give a little handle on this one uh, for a few moments, if I may? Going to be a few more minutes together. I'm even going to ask just for the musicians just to come as well at this point, because I want us just to sense the presence of God as I kind of give this like mini word about what's going on in the world right now. Why is all this going on? Why is all this going on? Can we have a little bit of music, Clark? Thanks so much. Um, well, first of all, it, it's the standard theologically correct answer to say the fall. Uh, the fall took place, and the scripture is very clear that although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. Their thinking became, became futile, and foolish hearts were darkened. I see a lot of futile thinking and foolish hearts in this world today. And so we say, oh, it's the fall. But here's the problem with that. When I blame the fall, and when I look at a tragedy and say it's their fault, 
And when I feel like the judgment of God in my veins and I want to say, the group that I have the biggest peeve with, it's probably their fault that this atrocity is taking place. I probably don't even understand the fall at all because I've separated myself from the fall. Augustine said, my sin was all the more incurable because I did not think myself a sinner. Now the Apostle Paul, when he gives his testimony in 1 Timothy chapter two, tells that he was a blasphemer and a violent man. In other words, I'm taking my responsibility in the fall. I was a blasphemer and a violent man. Do you know what he also says? He says, I am the chief of sinners. The Greek literally says, I am the chief of sinners. He wasn't saying, I was, the, and this, by the way, may not fit with your theology, but it's the Bible. And if the Bible doesn't fit with your theology, you need to get your theology to agree with the Bible, right? He says, I am. That is the correct interpretation. He believed himself to be, he wasn't being falsely modest. He believed that he was profoundly responsible for the fallenness of mankind. And I think we're moving into true spirituality when we go, I am the chief of sinners, and we actually believe it down to our toes and to the top of our heads. Kyle Eidelman tells the story of how he was witnessing to the husband of a new believer. The new believer, the, the wife, was demonstrating a Christ-like character change, and the husband could not deny it. But the husband had a big problem with himself being a sinner. And he was saying, it's a little unfair to compare me to God. And so he just compared himself to others. He thought that spiritually speaking, he was like a spiritual jaywalker. A few little sins, nothing that major to be really worried about. And while he was saying this, suddenly his wife started speaking and cut his legs from away, uh, cutting his legs away from him. She said to her husband, is it okay to get drunk and yell at your wife? Is it okay to lie about your sales numbers? Is it okay to promise your grandchild that you'll be at the game and not show up? And that man was slain when he realized that he is the chief of sinners. And so we love to say it's the fall. And that's horrible, that horrible person, that nasty section of society. That's where the judgment of God is coming from. Oh yes, we are tempted to do that. And when we do that, we're probably as far away from God as we could possibly be. It's not till we say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner, that we begin to be close to the living God. As long as we're the Pharisee saying, thank the Lord that I'm not like that nasty tax collector, we're gonna be far from God. But when we say, God, have mercy on me, a sinner, we're close to the gospel. We've never been closer to the things of God. I wanna say, friend, your sin is great, but the Savior is greater. If we cover up our sin, we cover up grace. Why would we want to do that? We proclaim the awfulness of sin today, but we proclaim the wonder of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now we must guard against doing things that bring about God's displeasure. I've been to the Dead Sea Plain that was destroyed in the time of Sodom and Gomorrah, and clearly promiscuity and homosexual sin was famous in the, in the Dead Sea Plain. There are warnings in Scripture. When Israel finally went into exile, it, it came because Manasseh led the people into idolatry and child sacrifice, which I call abortion. There are some sins that are unquestionably in the past have had a great bearing on God's judgment. But I want to say this. When we try to say this is happening because of that sin, Jesus warned us not to do that. I talked about this the other day in Luke 19. He said, that tower that fell, that 9-11 in Israel that fell, some people want to say it was their sin, and Jesus says, don't you dare go there. That's not true, Jesus says. And then he said, instead, repent yourself. In other words, it's the theology of the chief of sinners. I am the chief of sinners. If we have any other view of the judgment of God, then it's their sin, it's their sin, it's their wrong. The judgment's going, all the hurricanes, it's happening because of that person or that thing. Can I just say, wrong in Jesus' name. Right theology says, I'm the chief of sinners. God have mercy on me, Lord, I repent of my sins. Can I have an amen on that one? Yeah? Because when we do that, it separates us. When we blame our pet peeve, 
It separates us and I don't think it brings righteousness any closer. But when we say, God have mercy on me, a sinner, Jesus is very susceptible to that prayer. And I find in my walk with him, the closer I am to saying, wash me clean, fill me with your spirit. And that doesn't mean that we walk around all the time on our faces, but I don't think we can really be lifted up with joy till we realize how great is our salvation in Christ alone through his precious blood. So I wanna thank God for Jesus today. We thank God for the great salvation we have and we thank God that Jesus is coming back. I want us to stand and I wanna read this to us right now for to us a child is born, to us a son is given and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness. From that time on and forever, the zeal of the Lord will accomplish this.